fully assign it to you. And that's how money is made there. And we're talking tens of thousands of dollars here. Wow. Yeah. So I can see how they might be reluctant. However, I keep thinking like this is this is a problem that can be solved with a better engine. It just needs good processing power. Okay. Let's I see. think it's time, right? Yes, it is. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the Antel Inside Science Fiction Book Club. Hosted by Haskeek, our previous sessions have included a reading and discussion of The Wall by Gautam Bhatia and a discussion of Bengali science fiction from past to the present. Today, of course, we are here with the amazing Yudhanjaya Vijayaratne, and we are talking to him about his book, The Salvage Crew. A uh, few notes before we begin. Uh, please keep your mics on mute and uh, keep typing in your questions for Yud uh, Yudanja on the chat box and we shall take them up later in the session. To introduce myself, I am Vijay Lakshmi. Uh, I'm the author of Strangely Familiar Tales. Um, I also write for Women's Web on uh, issues of pop culture and feminism. Uh, my co-moderator today is the wonderful T.G. Shanoi. Uh, T.G. Shanoi is an SFF enthusiast and columnist and critic. He's the writer of India's longest running weekly SF column, New Worlds Weekly for Factor Daily, and the Specfix column for Bangalore Mirror. He also curates the SF track for Bangalore Lit Fest. He has featured in podcasts such as the Tale Harate Kannada podcast, and events such as the Sri Lanka Comic Con to talk about SFF in general and Indian SF in particular. He hosts to boldly go a fun SFF quiz every Saturday. He is also an advertising and marketing professional and is currently a consulting partner with Celsius 100 Consulting. And of course, the person we are all looking forward to talking to today is Yudhanjaya. Uh, Yudhanjaya Vijayaratne is the author of The Salvage Crew, The Inhuman Race, Number Cast, and The Slow Sad Suicide of Rohan Vijayaratne. His stories are included in anthologies like Future Visions and the Expanding Universe. His novelette Messenger was nominated for the 2019 Nebula Awards. His work has also been published on Wired, Foreign Policy, and Slate, and has appeared on Amazon bestseller lists. His novels are available from HarperCollins and Aethern Books. As a data scientist, he works with the data, algorithms, and policy team at Learn Asia. He also co-founded and helps run Watchdog Sri Lanka, a fact checker. He's also the creator of OSIN, a set of AI plus human literary experiments. When not doing these things, he argues with his cat, as his bio on his website, yudhanjaya.com states. Welcome, Yudhanjaya. I had a lot of fun reading The Salvage Crew, and I'm really excited to hear more about it from you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And I should I should know that the cat wins almost all those arguments. <laughs> <laughs> Shenai, do you want to get us started off? Yeah, I mean, um, so we are here today to discuss the Salvage Crew. Uh, quite possibly the first full-length novel, which has been co-written using uh, GPT-2. I mean, you can co-written using AI to use the uh, uh, going term. Possibly the first published. I know that in 2016 there was a Japanese literary experiment that made a that made a few headlines. It um, was long listed or short listed for a Japanese a prestigious Japanese literary prize. Yeah, and, it, was a, and, it was a prize. Yes. Yes, and in that case as well, it was a case of co-authoring. Uh, there are and there, there's several years worth of I think people attempting poetry, um, and yeah, this may be the first published uh, sort of commercial work of fiction. Yeah, like I said, the first published full-length science fiction yeah. novel. I mean, yeah, it, but they have, definitely. but they have, you know, been tons of brilliant people around the world taking stabs at this. Yeah. I mean, hashtag meta, right? A science fiction, futuristic science fiction novel. This thing, and uh, so uh, to give you brief about uh, the salvage crew, it's about, I mean, a salvage crew which has been sent to this planet called Umahon Beta to salvage something and. You know, uh, it's as the description says, it's not uh, an A team or a B team or probably a C minus team um, working yeah. together uh, with sort of cobbled together, uh, 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 what shall I say, gear, you know, um, and the ship is, uh, and the overseer is an AI 
who used to be human uh, in, in, in a previous life uh, and the adventures that they go through and they land on this planet on, on Mount Beta and they're looking for what they have to salvage and what looks like, a, you know, cheap and cheerful, get in, clean up, get out job, just sort of yeah. gets, yeah. It you know, starts, becoming starts more, and more, more and more complex, and more and more challenging. You have mega beasts, you know, mega fauna to deal with. You have these strange uh, mercenary crews to deal with and all of this. Plus the crew has their own issues. Uh, so, I mean, I, and without giving away spoilers, it's also a first contact novel, unlike any that has come before because of how and why the, the first contact uh, happens. And uh, so with that being the sort of brief introduction, and it, I mean, I, I loved it. Uh, it was like a nice space adventure, right? Lots of things happening, lots of action happening and the stakes keep getting higher with every half a chapter. So you have like one mega beast. Next thing you have like 12 mega beasts with zombie riders. Uh, so that's how. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, a lot. A, a lot of uh, current contemporary science fiction has started becoming very sort of serious and very dystopian and all this. This sort of, you know, that sense of wonder, as they say, it sort of captured that for me as well. So, yeah. Yudha, I just want you to. I, I should. I to, think I should. You know how Salvage you came about, and you know. Sure, I should probably add that the, 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 the world the Oseer lives in is not a pleasant one where sort of um, where like these like tiny farmsteads trying to live on planets are harvested and these people are given this like, a hugely economic choice of hey do you want to make do you want to make some money or do you want to die and do you want your corpse to rot on this planet because your fathers and ancestors were here and it's very much like a you know the overseer's bosses basically say, well, yes, we might want to, yeah, we kind of think your crew doesn't need life support right now because budgets are a thing, dude. It doesn't really matter. Humans are flesh and flesh is weak. So it's, it's, it, I'm glad that there is a sense of water there. It's, it's still pretty, I wouldn't still want to live in that world. But yeah, so, sorry, um, how it came to be. Yeah. And Okay. And, and, and you, you also said that, you know, when you gave it to people to read and publishers, many of the humans failed the Turing test. So, yeah. Okay. So, so how it came to be was um, when GPT-2 came out, um, the open AS GPT-2 obviously made a huge uh, media spectacle. Uh, for what was essentially a transform architecture trained on lots of data and was able to write. Now, there is a certain narrative, there's a certain marketing push there, but it was able to present pieces of journalism uh, that seem, that look like they were written by, they might pass for being written by humans at, at, a, at a first glance. This article, for example, about unicorns. Uh, so they had asked it to write an article about unicorns. They had come up with this discovery of unicorns written almost exactly like the BBC would report on it. Very sober reporting, very like interviews with fictional scientists that, that it had clearly made up on the spot. And I looked at this, I was, I was very interested because um, I had this theory that uh, this whole cyberpunk thesis of uh, humans and AI and humans and AI, it's, it had been playing around in my head for a long time by then. And I had started to dislike the constant questions of, of will AI take our jobs? Will, will AI actually write a human, uh, write a novel? Uh, will the great American novel be written by AI, for example? And to me, these questions are fundamentally boring um, because they showcase the whole Skynet man versus machine thinking, which we've seen in Ruhr, we've seen in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. There's a long legacy of that terminating, literally being terminated by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, and this is, um, you know what, it's boring to me, at least personally. Uh, so I started thinking of what actually happened when AI has defeated man, man has been defeated by machine. And I looked through news archives and I found Gary Kasparov getting his ass handed to him in by Deep Blue at the end of the 90s, the greatest chess grandmaster of the world. And it was a media outro, you know, 
man being defeated by machine, the end of humanity, etc. Um, but what Kasparov did next was the truly inspiring part. He came back with the field, promoting a field called advanced chess or centaur chess, um, which is essentially where instead of uh, a human versus uh, a chess engine or chess engines versus chess engines, it's a combination of a human and a chess engine against a human and a chess engine. So you have a much more... Uh, so, and they and they found that some of the some of the highest elo ratings some of the best chess players in the world at the time came from this group of people who were doing this that the human plus machine combination was far stronger the synthesis because you could have the machine do what it did best the depth search the constant going through the similar program tracks of thought and you could have the human bringing in the randomness the creativity the sense of play and the sense of unpredictability and so you found random schoolboys and then mid-rank chess players um, suddenly operating far above grandmaster levels and to me this was very cyberpunk and this was very interesting. And I thought, okay, so instead of just writing about it, which is fun, can I try to live that? I mean, is it possible to try and sort of not just write science fiction, but actually to try and do some of this stuff? Because that would be pretty cool. And I had the skills to do it. So I took GPD-2, I retrained it, I turned it into an Instagram poet called Urson. And I let her run for a while and... Um, Actually, weirdly enough, Orson gained a following. And there were people come uh, like, Orson is also this basically an Instagram bot, so in context, it's a Python program, goes around, follows people. If they don't follow back in three days, we'll unfollow them. <laughs> like, occasionally comments on like the hashtag Instapoid, hashtags and so on, hashtags her work and so on. And Typical influencer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And within like a very short period, um, it built up an audience of people, like a, t a tiny one. This is just a micro test, right? A hundred or so followers started with nine posts and a hundred or so followers I mean, and people are commenting saying, oh my God, this is so meaningful. This is so insightful. People are DMing, asking for collaborations. I thought, okay, this has legs. Uh, poetry is done and dusted. Let's see how I can take this and develop it. And at the same time, this is neatly intersected with, with my work because I work sort of as a computational ling linguistics is sort of the bread and butter of what I do. So at the time I was working on this gigantic corpus of uh, 28 million words in Singhala that was part of my research. So I think a lot about language and, and I, at the time I was thinking about Wittgenstein. And I kept thinking, okay, we've got something generating uh, syntax, it's generating grammar, it's generating structure and words. Now, what are sort of theories of intelligence and what would um, what would a machine that is uh, so self-aware but places a great deal of weight is obsessed with language what would it look for what what would it look like what would it react like and out of that basically grew the the eventual first contact you know where it doesn't really care if you have starships and, and metal cans it's like yeah i'm bored by all of this stuff you keep you keep repeating navigation coordinates to each other i've seen millions of species do that that's not special but are you playing the language game that's special sorry i think you're muted no spoilers um, yeah yeah so that's why but that's that's sort of where the genesis those two things came first the machine poet and the thought of what would something look like that might find this machine poet interesting and those two ends of the book sort of came first and the rest of it, um, I started getting serious about this. And I'm a huge fan of RimWorld, Dwarf Fortress, a lot of games where procedural generation has been a critical component of world building. Diablo, initially these things arose out of constraints, like Diablo, for example, they couldn't fit all the content they wanted. So they, um, same, for, same for Elite, the first, first Elite, right? Um, they, so they started writing programs that could generate entire universes on the fly. So this is, you know, this is incredible uh, because one of the problems in computer science in this branch of computing is that people will take, uh, say, the collected works of J.K. Rowling, feed them into a generator, and then laugh at the output. And every time you know, we have nanogen mo and so on, uh, then there are all these methods. They're, they're, you know, incredibly sophisticated in their own right. 
but they don't really mimic an author's process where we think about the world, we think about the characters, we think about the plot and prose, and all of these things operate at multiple levels. It's not one giant chunk that you can then spaz on, but these are all subtle little things that have to be combined. It's like a layer cake, really. Uh, actually, that's an interesting analogy. Okay, save that for later. Uh, so I started, I realized that, you know, video games and some of my favorite games have been doing this layer cake for a long time. In fact, there, they're incredibly good at it. We have God simulation games right now. So I thought, well, why don't I teach myself some of that stuff? So I can, I can work not just with, with an AI poet, which I possibly have limited use for, and it's just like inspiration, but why can't I have the world being generated? God, so I said like, God made the world in six days, surely we can do better. Uh, and his uh, act of supreme hubris, I created a galaxy generator inspired by No Man's Sky. Wrote the thing in our, the first version is it's open source, it's on my GitHub. I hope nobody uses it because it's janky as hell, but it does effectively generate a, a galaxy in a way that makes sense to me as an author. I don't necessarily care about coordinates of star systems. I don't care about absolute coordinates. I care about the story path. So what it does is it generates stars and planets and in the current version, civilization artifacts and a whole lot of stuff and chains them together like a social network. So it's like, hey, if you're at this planet, you, you will also have a wormhole to this planet. Maybe you know some people here, maybe events here are influencing you. So it's essentially, I took sort of my background on, uh, on like looking at social networks and data science and all that and combine that into a series of world generators. I mean, so this, yeah, this, this gives world building, quote unquote, a whole different meaning altogether. I mean, you're literally building worlds because I, in, even in the foreword, I, I, I saw that you spoke about, you know, planet generators and, you know, and also using Markov chains and, you know, yeah, which yeah. dictated the weather patterns. Yeah. And, you know, when, when uh, Milo and Anna would fight, Right, so yeah, you know, like so, the, the, the conductor making sure everything just sort of goes smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going U symbols, U base, and I'm sort of I was sort of like the lead singer, I'd say, for a metal band. <laughs> <laughs> on cue, on cue. <laughs> yes. So I was sort of like the lead singer, sort of making sure. Hey, I'm singing the song. Are the drums playing? Is the bass guitar working? Is everything plugged in? Cool, let's jam. And it was fantastic. I usually take, um, because this to me was, an, it was just an experiment I was tripping on, right? So um, I usually take upwards of, I realize a year and a half or two to write a novel because initially there's like a year of just thinking and putting material together. This was the most free form I'd ever been. I usually, um, like my outlines right now stretch like 30 pages with another 20 pages of citations in APA format so that I can come back and actually find stuff. Uh, and then I slowly build scenes out of those. This, I literally just sat there and started blank page, smooth sailing start to finish, possibly wrote it in about two and a half to three months. Wow. It was just, just basically because at every point, like whenever sort of the, the meter started running empty, there would be something saying, hey, the weather changes. By the way, it's a blizzard. And my mind would immediately go, right, it's a blizzard. These guys are going to lose the crops that I've been building in this chapter. This is going to be like, Milo is going to be so pissed off. Anna is going to be devastated. They're both going to be at each other's throat. And then another thing would say, okay, um, event, random event, um, Milo and, um, you know, a bunch of the Mercer call, um, are going to have a con conflict, and here's what the here's what the mercenary has on their loadout, uh, and I go, okay, that in winter, an invisibility cloak in winter, that's going to freak them the hell out. So it was just something, just basically throwing in stuff there into the pot. It was fantastic. It really felt like cooking to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I quite understand. You could see your. It was very obvious that you were having fun and throwing in all the things that I mean all those little pop culture references and the references to sci-fi classics and it is all sort of, you know, sort of just, just came together. There's Wittgenstein, there's, uh, you know, Buddhist philosophy. I mean, is there anything you, you didn't put in here? 
let's find out in the next book <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly i mean which is why we decided to call this you know the games on stopping i mean which is vijay's yeah. choice uh, you know like you promised us in the foreword that the games yeah. are stopping here and yes. you know, dedicated so you know, be- before i gave it to the publisher i had like obviously i didn't know if this would work out but i had collected the stuff the raw material for the next two novels and my challenge to myself was okay can i make it interesting i mean obviously you got to scale up um and i i think i did find a good way of scaling up of course in hopefully in a year or two you'll be able to tell me whether it was shit or not but uh, the game's on stopping yeah you definitely want like, something with we'll, we'll... yeah sorry vijay no i was just saying that 2020 is the perfect year for this book to come out because that planet is treating them the way 2020 is treating us like you yes. just keep throwing things at them and they have to adapt as quickly as they can takes their sanity and just slowly erodes it until there's nothing left yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah. Yeah. that was a trip yeah, for me like i don't understand the tech stuff as much because i'm definitely not a techie but for me it was the character that i really related to like there are really messed up people on this really planet yes, they are. and uh, you know like even though there's we are separated from them in time and space and all that i still found them very relatable especially uh, the first year oc you know who was like this he like really done with everything like really frustrated but also funny and you know also really philosophical at times and for me it kind of changed the way i think about ai because he is human like i found it very difficult to think of him as something artificial mm. so is that intended for uh, people to think about or how did well, that happen um so the thing is actual ai um is quite difficult to uh, if you t- throw aside the terminator stuff right um actual ai is superpowered statistics it is incredibly difficult to be excited about a superpowered spreadsheet um and i i did at the time i was also having a look at what an actual ai would look like in practice i did a piece for slate that essentially was imagining a, a sort of near utopia where you had this thing called the state machine that could dynamically understand the morals and changing social contracts of people in its periphery and reroll a new constitution every two weeks and about a human analyst who was studying it for his uh, for his master's degree and trying to make sense of it and realizing and asking some questions like who can know the extent of the mind of god because this is so many signals feeding into each other that there is almost no core to look at it's very ethereal um so classical ai one of the things one of my pet peeves in science fiction um is ai that weirdly seem to be human they have emotions why on earth would would something like that have emotions like if you were creating um a, a piece of software that was supposed to put be put on like the mass curiosity rover where it was expected to stay on like a ball of rock out there for years and years the last thing you want to do is give it emotions would you want that thing to be bored and terrified and lonely no so um so like a lot of people uh, one thing i'm really irritated with in science fiction was it's ai but it's basically just a human without the body so i took that and went to went okay what can i do to make myself satisfied and to make myself interested in this and hence the hence the theology hence the hence the buddhist theology part of this corporation overwhelmingly prefers to harvest um, buddhist because turns out if you sort of have an intrinsic belief in reincarnation it's actually not as much a shock to you when you wake up in a tin can um and you can treat this as a life or and things like the ship of theseus don't really bother you as much so it was my way of sort of making that concept interesting to me by throwing like a a gamut of things that i could like, put there and go okay now this is this is interesting enough that i want to write about it and, and there's a lot of cursing going on and doesn't get more human than that i mean have you <laughs> have you met me that's that's yes, i know i know i mean i'm just i'm just talking about the ai over here you are you know we call it ai but he was human and there's a lot of his humanity still 
uh, you know there in that tin can you know and his influences and why he does otherwise he wouldn't be doing poetry which is the, the brings me to the other bit of it that you know the the sheer amount of poetry that's uh, there uh, i mean I, and i'll be i'll be honest um uh, because i had known about uh, austin poet uh, and i was like okay fine here's poetry and there's is it poetry for the sake of poetry but then i read the poetry it made perfect sense suited the mood suited the plot uh, what oc was trying to do and trying to explain things to himself and to the people you know sort of it's his way of coping explain it all it's this way mechanism, right and like initially he's doing a lot of poetry but as he starts getting stressed even that keeps getting harder for him he does less and less and less as he's just like we are when you know cre- like creative work when stressed yes exactly i mean as, and it gets progressively difficult something that he used to do for himself he also sort of start sending the poetry to as the story progresses sending this poetry to other people as well you know sort of trying to sort of exactly. find a bridge of humanity or you know i understand and this is the way i can communicate and all this sort of thing so i thought that was that and okay i can put poetry so there's poetry there but till i came without giving out spoilers right and i wish somebody had told me this before i started the book that yes there is a you know beyond all of this beyond him using it as a coping mechanism uh giving in touch with you know or because he's interested in poetry that it actually has a serious purpose and is integral to the to the yeah, plot a, of really specific novel. reason it's there yeah we we should we should just sort of probably put a blurb out there saying that this poetry has a purpose Yes, there's a point to it <laughs> this art has I, meaning oh god huh this art has meaning oh god <laughs> <laughs> i mean vijay is a poet and she is a huge poetry buff so i'll i'll leave the poetry discussion to her mm. yeah i mean you might be interested so, then the the base corpus um, is of course gpt2's own work plus um rumi plus libai oh. and dufu 5th century tang dynasty poets oh. interestingly when i tried pouring in words of course when i tried pouring in words worth just for lulls things went horribly wrong because you have this weird uh, references to christian theology in a machine that shouldn't really have them but right. libai and dufu specialize sort of in capturing that that a moment and freezing it and just perfectly painting a picture with their words and a lot of chinese poetry really was like that and the, the classics of from the 5th centuries and that and then i found interestingly rumi seemed to play well the translations the language it fit like a hand in a glove and as a result that those are the poets that this was built on Yeah. and those influences are there like i could definitely find the uh, you know influence of you said the tang uh, dynasty poet which was it, definitely yeah. very much there and in that sense it definitely passes the turing test obviously because i don't think anyone can identify uh, you know, that uh, uh, you know it was not written by you yeah because i did die, i yeah. just to be sure i ran a plagiarism check against the original against the collection i was like okay this is surprisingly like 80% of everything generated and this generated like hundreds of poems um that aren't, aren't in this like 80% of everything generated was did, did actually was not like the page of some interesting hmm. i mean that was one thing that was wondering uh, sorry sorry you know go ahead no, no, i was just saying if you couldn't make out whether the poem was written by a person or an ai and all this i don't know whether it what it says about human poets or whether that's a commentary on the training data and the output. okay so to be brutal um a lot of instagram poetry shit uh, this is possibly a known fact but yep. a lot of instagram poetry is also incredibly easy to automate it's easy to get this sort of because what some people essentially do is type a sentence hit carriage return in the middle it so there is in my head sort of this idea of a classification of art based on how easy it is to mimic it now your average insta poet yes also can easily take them on um someone like um, let's say tennison writing ulysses magnificent work uh someone like ts eliot writing the wastelands which is actually 
it, it should be technically easier because it has such a disconnected schema tying into this much greater structure. Um, no, no, that would be at the current at the state things are right now, that would be incredibly difficult. So there is almost this, this curve and there's automatability on one end and that's your, that's the art that really, I don't think it should be called out. And there's the good stuff on the other side. And this boundary keeps going, keeps moving forward. I mean, uh, I mean, Shana, you mentioned that thing about, you know, what does it say about the human poets? Um, like there is this line that he says to Anna at one point that all poetry is something about the poet. So, you know, it kind of made me wonder what it says about the AI poet here. And you know, then the whole concept of the Chinese room and all that, which again is addressed in the book at yes. one point. Yes. Um, a lot of that thinking, I think, I think the best, some of the best thinking done around this is in Peter Watt's Blindside, which is, which I highly recommend if you haven't. There is literally a sequence where they initiate first contact and they have a very coherent conversation. And it's a linguist who spots that the ontology on the replies doesn't seem to make sense. The classification of knowledge doesn't seem, seem to make sense. Grammar, syntax, perfectly fine. But there's something odd about how this thing seems to categorize knowledge. It was, it, for me, reading that was like, wow. Okay, this, this, is, like, this is the kind of thing I geek out over. So yeah, we, we'll still be needed. We'll still be around. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, it is a very creative, uh, piece of work like it's really exquisite poetry and some of, these, some of those turns of phrases and the juxtaposition of words I mean they're excellent like if I I just read out one of those poems which is a bit of a landmark poem and really stuck uh, struck me greatly okay? okay so I moved here in spring from my ancestor's garden and have lived here among the green hills and woods at midnight when the cold makes the ground slightly wet, I lie down to sleep in the twinkling of an eye. On the bank, surrounded by polymer and metal, I watch clouds scurry as if they had been given the chance to breed and to fly their perch with as many as were chosen. In the mornings, I wake to the silence of the sun, but now distant peoples from scattered lands have come to wake me with their hunger. How to tell them apart from the birds? Only the clouds have the answers and the shadows. Now, this is a pretty landmark poem in the book for reasons. No spoiler. <laughs> but uh, also, I, I mean, I love this because there's so much of that natural imagery. And then suddenly you have that one line about, you know, the bank being made of polymer and metal. And that really kind of shifts your uh, perspective. So I love how the poetry plays around with uh, imagery and things like that. Just, I, Thank mean, you. Love I, I find it fascinating, like how, like I, that was a lovely reading. Thank you so much for Thank that. You. I find it fascinating Thank how, what people, how, what people react to. I mean, much like poetry itself, right? The author is dead. People give it their own, own meaning. Absolutely. And I mean, how, how have the reactions been to the poetry and to the book? Um, in general, amazing. <coughs> so, it, so it's interesting to see, like, um, uh, on Audible, I think reactions have been absolutely amazing, thanks in part to the narrator, who's Nathan Fillion. Uh, you know, people are, people are making comments like, I uh, saw one saying, as someone who is into religion and is also a programmer, this book changed my life. And that's tremendously flattering to hear and also kind of all beams, like there is this sense of, I don't know how to react to this. Um, and, you know, it, it's been absolutely amazing. I think people who expected more Firefly because there was also that link with, with Nathan coming in as a narrator. People who expected more Firefly, I think, may have been a bit disappointed. And this is something, this is like the nature of, of what's being created, right? Because if you're expecting like an upbeat drama about the resistance, you know, lone man, gunslinger stuff. Uh, no, these people, like you said, these people are, have some serious issues. And uh, <laughs> the planet is attrition on a different level. 
it's it's not a it's not a it, it's me having fun, but those characters, Cyber and Ada and Milo, are not having fun at all. I mean, like one of my favorite pieces is just four lines. You know, I just read. I mean, for reasons as you'll see, it's like it made sense to me that coming home, the old soldier craves peace, but broken men around him stir. Souls are drawn, battle cries ring, blood spills like tears in the rain. Yes, I got the reference. Yes, you got the reference. I mean, I love this. Is, this is me. This is my moment of happiness. I mean, I love. I mean, I, I love anything that you know has this has these little touches and nods to stuff that you love, and then just takes it off in a different uh, direction. And uh, to to come back to what you said about audible and uh, you know that uh, there was quite the coup getting uh, uh, Captain Mal Reynolds himself to uh, read it. So make you know. uh it is nathan fillion's first uh, audiobook narration unless i'm uh, mistaken no no i don't think it was the first he's done lots of audio work before he's actually done lots of audio work for halo even um he's i think he's not known as an audiobook narrator because because of course captain mal and then richard castle these are such iconic. iconic yeah i mean these are roles that are cemented in geekdom um but but he has done a significant amount of audio work i actually first uh, be, i actually heard his voice on a halo game long before i watched firefly oh okay uh, on on that note should we just play the first chapter for a few minutes for sure sure right for our listeners as well uh let me just share my screen and we'll this is how it begins just a second i need to optimize it for uh... yeah so this is how the salvage crew starts part 1 don't stick the landing one i want to make one thing clear i did not repeat not ask for any of this I did not ask to be promoted I did not ask to be made overseer and I certainly did not ask to be strapped down in this tin can body of a drop pod hurtling down with three idiots screaming their lungs out inside me The company promised me an A team the kind of people Joe Haldeman wrote about in the Forever War astrophysicists who could blow a man's head off at 500 meters the best of the best you know the master chiefs and all that the kind of people who go in get shit done leave a nice calling card and live to strike a heroic pose did we get what it said on the label well let's look around exhibit a simon juston simon is my geologist he's 35ish biological time and looks like someone stuck eyeballs on a map they told me simon would be reliable he's good at everything to do with rocks and earthquakes He scored well in the shooting sims. He can do CPR and basic medical aid and looks like your average nerd trying too hard to be cool. He'll make a fine crew member. But here's what they didn't tell me. Simon grew up on the brutal world of old New York. He was sold to a corporation as a child. They stuck a needle into the center of his brain stem and jacked him into a virtual fantasy world so they could broadcast his feed as reality TV. As reality TV. His entire childhood was spent being beaten up by gangs and digging holes in fake ground so nobody could hear him crying in the fake darkness except for the audience of course who must have had a who the sick bastards old new york had its times after the mercator risk rebellion the un jumped in and did a number on them including yanking out those poor souls out of reality tv and setting them free for some reason i don't think this man ever really recovered I'm not saying Simon is a bad person. I'm saying what doesn't kill you makes you stranger. I'm saying a traumatized reality TV slave star is the last person I want dropped into an unexplored planet on my first landing mission. Exhibit B. Anna Agrawal. Anna is an odd fish. She's got 20 years on Simon, but unlike Simon, Anna grew up with everything she ever wanted. I've checked her degree transcripts. They're through the roof. high social skills and then 
Somewhere along the line, she decided to ditch everything and become an army doctor. Doesn't compute. You know why it doesn't compute? Because Anna Agarwal doesn't exist. I don't know who the hell this person is, but the real Anna Agarwal, as verified by her gene sample, died on the microplanet we were child. This imposter, let's call her fake Anna, showed up on Arjuna 3 and has been hopping planets ever since, always moving outwards. Deus Olympus. Boat murdered. Karthika Highway. This kind of stuff is real easy when delays between databases are measured in light years. Fake Anna picked up a gunshot wound somewhere on the way, left leg. And now, she's on my mission, on the very edge of human space. Right now, she's cradling Simon as he screams, which, excuse me, Anna, is the stupidest fucking thing you can do while strapped inside a tin can, plummeting through the atmosphere. Damn it, Anna, go back to your seat. Exhibit C. Milo Kalik. Finally, a sane choice. Milo, 37, is an inventor. He can shoot, yes, but also make stuff and argue Machiavelli and Chanaka by the fireside. Master's degree in engineering from the Ort Academy. There are some irregularities. He's been demoted three times so far, each time by a woman commander. That's odd. And he's spent a weird amount of time in cryosleep. Almost three centuries. But right now, I don't have much to go on, so he's my golden boy. Look at him smile. He's enjoying this. He's enjoying being alive after all that time in the freezer. Don't let me down, Milo. Simon pukes all over him. All over me. Oh, gods. This isn't an A-team. This is a D-team with a paint job. The real heroes are probably out somewhere in the inner rim, discovering alien civilizations while looking heroic in their armor. Me? I get the backwater planet and the salvage job. Go dig up an old crash site, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Which brings us to myself. I'm the drop pod. Yeah, go ahead, laugh. I'm a 4.4 ton safety capsule hurtling through a sky the color of topaz. Inside, I'm a state-of-the-art computer equipped with weapons, seed stock, building materials, people, and of course, myself, to instruct the baselines how to do their job. In turn, the theory goes, the humans ask the right questions, make the right pseudo-random moves, nudge your thinking in all the right ways, ways that a machine can't. Humans evolved to survive, and they're fantastically good at it. The combination of myself and a human crew is supposed to make us better, faster, a little more chaotic, yes, but a lot more survivable. This is what happens when PCS thinks you're smart enough to be an overseer. You end up knee-deep in theory with Simon's puke all over your instrument panels. For fuck's sake, Anna, strap yourself in. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Yeah, and, and, and thanks for delivering on that marketing pitch that it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the whole... Like, the whole book was me laughing, basically, uh, because the joke of, like, humans being saved at random. Yeah. I mean, of course, the book sort of felt very indulgent, but the techno babble was so glorious. And it's, it's, it's nice to be along on a fun ride, because it's been a while since I read something which was sort of good old-fashioned space adventure. Uh, Right. Uh, so it, it is nice uh, to see it again in a book, you know, how, how they, uh, you know, uh, of course, the Martian uh, told us about all oh, this, you know, one man rising up and all that sort of a thing. This took a very realistic look about actually building a hab and creating the water. And I liked how they prioritize vodka. Right. I mean, right. these are people after my, my own heart. Right. I mean, vodka is important. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, right. I, don't, I, mean, think like, anyone's, right. I don't think anyone's going to survive without alcohol. <laughs> right. Alcohol is like art. I mean, it won't change things too much, but it makes reality bearable. And yeah, so yes. they had their they had their priorities right. And what about all the 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 megafauna and all of those things in the the, the city? I mean, you know, how did you sort of just slot them in together? Because I mean, as almost expecting every chapter to sort of end on a cliffhanger, right? It's like the, the good old fashioned, you know, serialized stories. Like you're, you're expecting a cliffhanger, but it's just, of course, plays havoc with those sort of expectations and conventions. So the megafauna of uh, a nod 
to Dreamworld, um, it's because I'm a huge Dreamworld fan. I'm also a huge fan of the creator of Dreamworld. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm a particular fan of a blog post that he wrote that actually inspired what I would eventually do here. Um, Dreamworld is this game. It's a it's a colony simulator, um, and essentially people get so into it that they create entire stories out of what happens. And the creator points out that this is that humans have the tendency, uh, well, we have apophenia, which is the ability or the tendency rather to see patterns in random noise. That's how we, we look at the prehistoric man crawls out of cave, sees rain falling down and sees thunder and lightning and dreams of gods. And over time, these things keep getting more and more complex. We keep falling prey to things like astrology and prophecies, which are, again, predetermined patterns. And we keep looking for random noise that the patterns just fit so nicely on. And we go, yay, Nostradamus called it. Which is what makes us such great conspiracy theorists. But which is also one of our greatest strengths. The ability to see those patterns is what then lets us create stuff. It's what lets us imagine. Uh, so it's one of our greatest strengths, also one of our greatest weaknesses. Yeah. I mean, that because is, Malko Older sort of calls it the narrative disorder. Right? The narrative disorder, yeah. yeah. And uh, this is possibly like, you know, uh, uh, this is most likely like a holdover from, from you know, a couple of 10,000 years ago when the person who was looking out into the night and seeing tigers and wolves and things a little bit more fearful and possibly a little bit better prepared to survive. And the tiger eventually did take out the camp. And so we have this. And this was actually instrumental to my thinking of how to put these different components together. Um, the mega, so the Megabees were an explicit nod as a mark of respect um, to that game, its stature, its the creation of it, but also its influence on me. Um, Boat Murdered, one of those planets mentioned, is the name of uh, a Dwarf Fortress game. So Dwarf Fortress is even more complex, right? But it's famously difficult to play because it's rendered purely in ASCII. The common joke about Dwarf Fortress is the creator has figured out how to simulate 42% of the universe. Uh, because when you start a game, it generates tens of thousands of years of history, all these entities, all of these, these incredibly rich world. Boat Murdered was a game slash almost an art project. Uh, this is Dwarf Fortress is essentially about dwarves kind of building their own minds and mine of Moria kind of thing. You are very much an, you are an overseer, literally. And you're toggling these things and trying, and these people don't do anything of what they'd expect, what you'd expect them. That's, that's a classic of the, the um, of the colony simulator style of, of gaming. Um, Boat Murdered was a game that spanned 13 players. Each player would inherit the kingdom of the previous, and there would be all these design decisions and all these things happening and wars and stuff that they have no context in. They just stepped into their predecessor's shoes. And it would it, it ended with like 200 dwarves eating each other and worshiping elephants and play, painting, like creating incredible works of art in their own blood. It was incredibly dark towards the end. It was fascinating. No, I mean, it's it's it, it's really fascinating, and you know the forward itself will lead one down many a uh, internet rabbit hole. Lots of rabbit holes there. Yes, yes quite a lot of rabbit holes there. Uh, yeah. You know, and so that by the time you actually start the book, I mean, if you have once you read the forward, it's like ah. Your head is spinning already, and then in comes Yudhanjay Vijayaratne with the first chapter and goes boom. The forward was meant to be an afterword, and the publisher actually liked it so much that they were like, Why don't we shift this to the front? So, oh, okay. It was meant to be, you know, afterwards, hey, if you had fun reading this, and you know, nobody really reads afterwards most of the time, if you had fun reading this, maybe 1% of people would go, Oh, okay, you bastard. Right. Uh, no, that was what it's meant to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if you ask me, I mean, I it looked like it belonged in the back because you know when you pick this book up, you're like you want to get straight in on the action. Yes. Yes. Right. You don't want to go down internet rabbit holes, right? Exactly. Googling and then once you go in there, it's like you know, exactly. uh, it's four o'clock in the morning and you haven't yet started chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, then the book is a success. I should uh, I should just stick to writing four words instead. <laughs> <laughs> a book book made up of uh, of four words. Of four words, um, which uh, I think if you read Neil Gaiman's 
uh, view from the cheap seats, seats. I think he did a lot of forwards to a lot of people and it's uh, and there are significant numbers of forwards in there and those forwards are amazing I mean Neil Gaiman really knows how to write a forward yeah no I mean those, those, those more than forwards they are sort of essays in their own right like and the one where he introduced the whole Penguin series the only other person yes. who writes like amazing you know uh, forwards which are like standalone essays in their own right in that sense is Adam Roberts Right. Absolutely. And then Gaiman's is always this, it, and even, even Robert's like, there always this insight into the creator. And there are these anecdotes that you will not find anywhere else. There's this style of thinking that you go, this is a fresh take on something. So mine was more very, because like I sort of, I mean, I do a lot of academic writing. So mine was more, okay, and if you enjoy this, here's a methodology. You know, you've seen the abstract, that's the first page, you see the, the results, uh, that, that's what you've read through. Here's the methodology section. Right. So, yeah. So, what, what I would say is, I mean, A, it's a, it's a great book. And if you're a sort of science fiction fan and geek, you will f have lots of reasons, you know, sort of while reading, you know, picking out little references to Tannhauser Gates and the sort of mention of a Hyperion uh, museum. So, it, it, all old favorites, you know, sort of touchstones of science fiction and sort of late 20th century pop culture being just sort of thrown in. So there's, you know, it, it's like you said, a layer cake, whether it's in the, it was in the writing, which you described it to, or in the reading of it uh, thereof. Did you? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely that sense of fun and wonder and all of that, but there are also like, you know, deeper messages about capitalism and all that. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's like a really nice blend of all those things. So it's it's like everybody has something in it that they can look forward to in the book. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the way the first contact happens and why that happens. And that's, uh, that's quite interesting. I, mean, I wish I could talk about it, but that would I be... Know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know! I know! Let me have something on the table. Like, let me yeah. have lots of time. Yes, exactly. But, but thank you. Oh, I'm very glad to see that. I'm just very glad to see your response. I'm glad that you like it. I'm also very glad to see that two people responded to two different things. You responded to the sense of wonder and the nods to like things that I find fascinating and the, the science fiction classics, whereas Vijay Lakshmi responded to the, the critique of these corporations coming in and turning like planets which, which just want to continue their way of life into nexus worlds and so on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, which is what makes us good, uh, you know, sort of co-hosts. I, I love this. I love this. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I add, uh... If the people who are watching this on YouTube or here on Zoom have any questions, now is the time. You can actually, since not many, you can actually unmute and ask questions to Yudhanjaya about his work or about Salvage Crew, which about if you haven't read yet, you must. How about my cat? No questions? Okay, I, I guess they're either busy uh, ordering the book, uh, right? Uh, and I, I think fair warning, I mean, if you're like me, who prefers reading physical books, um, I don't think that's coming anytime soon. Yeah, so there is a hardcover. Um, that's expensive and shipping is, that's a $19 book and shipping right now is $60 as uh, so of the time I checked to our, our sort of part of the world. Um, the paperback, the mass market paperback is coming in about five months because of COVID, the U.S. publishing industry has taken significant hits. The publisher is a small press, so this is like, um, this is serious damage. Um, but it, yeah, I would uh, recommend getting it on Kindle, honestly. Kindle. Or uh, yeah. DCB sent a message saying that uh, I've never heard Nathan Fillion's narration. He is awesome. So I guess... Uh, we know what TCV is going to buy, uh, and and yeah. read or listen <laughs> or listen. Yeah, listen. I guess I mean, and I am right. Uh, so for for me, it was personally a, a landmark because I only do physical uh, copies, so I don't am ever bothered with the Kindle. But this was one book that I really, like really wanted to read, so I got over all those things and actually ended up reading the full novel on my phone. May I recommend uh, that you get a Kindle? And no, I, it'll, A, I, I don't know. I have issues reading it on Kindle or on screen. Uh, B, 
as it is i am a very impulse buyer sort of a thing and i come back with these big stack mm-hmm. of tea mm-hmm. yeah. if i have a kindle yeah bye bye you know no, bye bye wallet that's that's the downside of, of having a kindle so having a kindle the, is fine. yeah the kindle experience is completely different from a screen by the way um it like it's actually easy on the eyes it, it doesn't look like a screen it actually looks like the words have been printed on plastic i suppose like it, it's somewhere between paper and a screen it it's brilliant and you have to see it to describe yeah, it um, very comfortable it. reading however the wallet hit is very serious because you go oh hey people people who enjoyed this book also bought this okay people who enjoyed that book also bought this would you like to continue browsing maybe and now you see why just business has so much money exactly and you know I, i would love for there to be the balance in the bank balance part of it so that's fair that's fair i, <laughs> I can't critique that of course my interest is to sell more books to you so i ideally you should be <laughs> getting this stuff but i really can't complain at all this is covid I did it i enjoyed it i'll recommend it so yeah any questions or queries anything from in tcv the people watching on youtube you can so i have i have a question because i mean both of you are being so engaged in the book space you run like online spaces for people to come and talk about books what's it been like doing this in in covid times is it business as usual or are things easier harder than before do you find yourself changing in response i mean how's it been i mean it's personally it's actually been see this uh until uh, as a book club actually started in the covid times and in a non covid situation because by then people had been used to zooms and webinars and you know so it's uh, it's much easier to do that maybe in a not if covid hadn't happened this book club may not have happened it's it's much easier to get people you know invite authors to join in and there's no problem of geography otherwise you know you don't have to wait for a lit fest or something like that to listen to mm-hmm. an author then there's the usual logistics logistic mm. issues and all of those things but mm. this this doesn't have that so it's actually made it a lot easier or for example the the the, the weekly science fiction quiz that i run yeah. right which actually started off as a one off lockdown thing is now been going on for 30 for while, years yeah. I, yeah i don't think we would have been able to do that in the physical yeah. space uh, you know so, i i found this interesting because um, like for example worldcom you know, the hugos are like I'm normally not able to attend these things because yeah. passports getting their expenses and so on and suddenly everyone's on discord and everyone's on zoom and suddenly like I can be in a panel um without actually having to spend several tens of thousands of dollars on plane tickets and so on um that no same yeah, because if it was not yeah if it was not for covid i don't think in, i would have ever attended the nebulas right yeah. or i wouldn't have been in a in a sort of a room uh, with you know big authors and writers that i like you know in a small intimate breakout room with some seven eight of us talking amongst ourselves even if i had attended the physical nebulas in person also mm. these people would be in their you know on 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 bubbles yes, or on that's, that's also the thing you know a lot of people say access that. is more yes. thing like a lot yeah, of people say conferences are like okay, physical spaces back back on and you you don't get the same experience online um it was, it was interesting because there are some conferences that i go to for research and so on where the experience is clearly diminished online because a lot of discussion about research particularly if it's you're waiting for peer review which might you know and the whole process of writing and publishing take can take months um you can't talk about or you can't you know get up on a stage and talk about it so you talk about it behind the scenes um and that's where you learn what exciting stuff is happening who's working on what ground breaking research how many years that might take all of this stuff but for so for that the science fiction and fantasy conventions as far as i've been the clustering is so tight between in groups that when you're there you you're still a stranger and barcon is pretty much the same experience almost in discord as it is they actually better in discord um than it is in person one thing i don't miss is the conference food no i don't miss that at all <laughs> yeah yeah that is uh, 
Right. Uh, TCV has asked a question saying, what role yeah. did GPT-3 play in the writing of this book? It was GPT-2. Uh, how did you seamlessly blend it with your creativity? I think we've already spoken about this uh, in the initial part. Uh, yeah. uh, most of it, yeah, most of it is stuff we spoke about. Yeah, so, uh, to recap, because I think TCV be... came in a bit late, so maybe... He came yeah, yeah. Yeah. So to recap a bit Go. late, um, uh, so to recap like a bit yeah, short, just quick short recap. fashion. Uh, GPT-2, 3, 4, 5 in particular, uh, because that, because like the larger models require a lot more memory to run and now uh, unwieldy to train. Uh, that mostly wrote the poetry, which is the sort of underlying it, the personality of the machine poet, like the, the overseer, the main character is a machine poet. It's also the underlying crux of the first contact as it happens. Um, the poetry was written uh, by GPT-2 I allowed myself to edit three words in each poem, up to three words, no more and no less. So the structure, uh, for example, those words, polymer and metal, those are things I put in there because that's not in the corpus. The Tang Dynasty poets didn't know anything about polymer. Right, um, right. But that's the limit of my edits. And that was, but that was more or less how I blended in, in with the story, the situation. It was essentially letting it generate... Um, a whole sheaf of poems because you just you type in the code and you hit let it generate 50 and then going through these and saying okay this is what these people are going through right now what what mirrors the kind of emotion that a stressed out machine poet would have what kind of things would they want out there in the world and selecting and then very very tight yeah, that's a short answer i mean yes I mean, the fact that you said that the polymer and metal poet editions is what reminds me that human poets still matter at the end of the human day. Human poets still matter. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't think AI is going to replace us. And I think, in honestly, even having that conversation is it gives into fears that shouldn't be fears. It's just generating fear on certain doubt. I think the future is collaborative. And yeah. in, an, in a sense, we are all cyborgs already. I mean, look at us. We are in different parts yeah. of the world, thousands of miles apart, we are having a conversation seamlessly. Uh, yeah. We can see each other, we have phones, all these things. Today we walk around with so many things that someone in medieval time would look upon as magic, or absolute sorcery. Maybe Merlin was just a guy with a smartphone. Yeah. And this happened yeah. to Wikipedia, he's very to King Arthur's court, right? So uh, I think this collaboration is a thing that's going to happen, um, regardless of whether you want it or not. I think that is a more that's a nicer future. At least I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. And it definitely comes through because the thought that I had after reading the book was that, you know, yes, like technology is something that you need not fear or, you know, push mm. away, but it's something that we can make it work with us, even yes. something that is yes. creative yes. and everything. yes. So, anyway, I think uh, that's it for today. Uh, this is a fascinating conversation, Yudhanja. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jida. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, so much for having me on. Absolutely love this. Yeah, and thank you to the audience uh, who's come in. Um, thank you, Shanoi. Um, uh, thank you to David, Asbik, uh, and the team. And uh, we'll see you again soon next month. Yeah. So as always, on the last Friday of every month. So we'll see you in the last Friday of uh, December peak holidays. December. Yeah, yes. and just to just to put in my own plug, Shinoi's quiz happens tomorrow. As a science fiction writer, I highly recommend it. It's an incredible learning experience if you just sort of sit back and just watch the questions and Google everything. It is absolutely fantastic. Right, yeah. Anybody who wants to attend to Boldy Co can just DM me. I'm at the Beko on Twitter uh, and I'll send you the Zoom link. Uh, thank you all for coming. It was lovely. Thank you, Yuda. Thank you, Vijaya. Thank you. Thank you. Has Thank gained. You, and thanks, David, well. for uh, you know ma making sure everything runs smoothly behind the scenes. Yep. Uh, yep. Right, and yeah, live long and prosper.